<laughs> well, hello, hello. Welcome. So glad it's Thursday. So glad it's time for a sketch session time. I have to tell you, I just had a total snafu. Hold on, let me just make sure that I see myself on the screen over here. Give me just a little second. So, oh yeah, good. Um, <laughs> so I was all ready and prepared and kind of thinking about what I'm going to teach you tonight. And I was kind of clicking around on YouTube because I always do a test before we go live, right? Just so I can test that the lights are good and that the sound quality is okay. And so I deleted the, the live stream that I had scheduled for us instead of deleting my um, little test recording. So just like a couple of minutes ago when I usually put up the, the um, we're getting ready um, slide that you usually see when you tune in early. Uh, I was like, hold on, where's my, where's my stream? Anyways, <laughs> I'm glad I got it going. Um, I hope you weren't too disoriented. I hope you're excited to come and draw with me tonight. Um, so glad we're back together for another round. I missed being here last week. I hope you liked the squirrel video, but tonight we're having another full hour and the subject matter is a landscape sketching. And in particular, this is gonna be really good for you if you've never drawn landscapes before or if you've dabbled and you always get confused on how to go about it. So this is gonna be a really nice, um, introduction to how to uh, go about a landscape sketch. And I will focus my narration and my kind of explanations on how to create a feeling of spaciousness, spaciousness and a feeling of depth in, into your sketches. So if that sounds good to you, then stay tuned, grab your pencils and be ready to draw along. Um, if you, hold on a second. <laughs> yes, I know Ted, right? I really got my, my heart rate up there for a second, so I'm glad I was able to figure it out. Um, so if you're new to this uh, and you're coming across this video for the very first time, hey, I'm Carolyn and I'm the owner of Cura Studios and that's where I teach classical drawing skills so artists like you can build a very solid foundation to explore your creative voice from. And every Thursday we get together to sketch for an hour plus, a little bit more than that usually, and we rotate subject matter. We go through figure, portrait, animals, and things, and um, that's um, today we were on things. Today we were on landscapes, and um, I like to think of these sessions as a place for you to come to where you know there's going to be a lesson prepared. All you have to do is bring your pencils and your paper, and, and there's going to be a, a coach for you there who is going to drag you through your drawing session and um, who's going to motivate you to keep going. And um, it's a little bit of a combination of playground where you just get to be free and have fun. Nobody's going to see whatever drawings you're doing. It's private, you can burn them afterwards, you can frame them afterwards, whatever feels better to you. And on the other hand, it's also going to be a little bit of a boot camp, a little bit of a workout, because as I said, I always prepare a lesson for you, right? So you choose, like on that spectrum from playground to boot camp, where do you fall tonight, today, wherever, whenever you find this session? Do you need to play or do you need to, um, oh, I hear my kid crying. How sad. Um, so anyways, do you need to play or do you need to um, work out hard? So you choose what is right for you. And um, let's see. So we wanted to do landscape. Sorry, I got sidetracked because I hear Penny, you know, she's five and a half and she went on a sco scooter ride with her dad and maybe she fell. So I got distracted. Um, yes, Marina, I'm so glad you're here. Okay, so let's Let's get into the meat of the lesson and get going. Again, if this is your first time, the best way to use this time together is to put this on a big screen so you can see the reference material nice and large. So if you have a big desktop computer, put it on there or maybe even on your TV. Um, and also, of course, I said this earlier, you wanna draw along. It's fine if you just wanna watch, but you're gonna learn so much more if you actually move pencils across paper. Trust me on that. Even if it feels awkward, this is how we learn and this is why I structure these les lessons so you can draw along with me. Okay, so we have three images tonight. I wanted to do two images where we just do very quickly 10 minute sketches, just to kind of um, have you go through this um, pattern that I'll explain 
briefly. And then we'll have a longer sketch where you can see how I will take this to a more refined end result. I mean, and these call these are called sketch sessions for a reason. It's not an art creation session, right? So sketches, they're rough. They're going to be unfinished. It's about learning things. Okay, I've chatted enough. Let's dive in. The thing with landscapes is this. There's a lot, <laughs> you know, when, when you're out and about, it's surrounding you all around. And I think that is the first thing that contributes to us getting overwhelmed when we try and draw it. We don't know where do we begin? You know, what do we put in the drawing? What do we leave out? Um, are you, am I supposed to like scan my head left or right? Or like, how does this work? So that is one problem we face, one obstacle we face, right? Just too much information and not really knowing how to make sense of it. The way you wrangle this is, um, hello there. Uh, I, can, I don't know how to say your name, Clipping Jessery. Nice to see you. So the, the way you deal with um, this overload of like, what could I draw is you need to limit yourself to a frame. And you don't need anything fancy. All you need are these. And you do this and you do this and you create a little frame for yourself. And you can zoom this frame out or in. So if you go like this, you'll include less. If you go like that, you'll include more. So this is when you're out in location, right? Um, if you have a photograph, just take the photograph. But I'll get into this later. Just because it's in the photograph, doesn't mean it has to be in your drawing later on because we will be editing things out. So um, just kind of a heads up for later. But if you're out and about, the first thing you want to do is close one eye and then do this and decide, do I want a vertical format or do I want a horizontal format? What do I want to include, you know? And once you have this, it comes to the second, I don't know what word I'm looking for, the second choice or the, the se second thing you have to do. You want to forget about all the names that you have associated with the things in front of you. So instead of thinking there's a path and there are trees and there's a sky and there are clouds and I don't know, bushes and whatever, forget about all of those names and you want to abstract what you see. Now, now what the hell does that mean? Abstracting things means you want to um, distill them into art language. So art language would be contour lines. Like what are the outer edges of something like? Art language would be shapes. When you squint and just kind of blur out all the details and all the variation, you just squint and you think about what's the silhouette? You know, if you had to cut this out of construction paper, what would that shape look like? So you want to think about your landscape in terms of shapes and not itty bitty shapes, but like really large masses almost. And you will notice that there are different zones. So a good landscape will have a foreground zone, a middle ground zone and a background zone. And if you squint again and you look just for the silhouette of those zones, you want to learn to just kind of overlap them in front of each other. So you have a zone right here that might look like this. Then you might have a zone right there and a zone right there. And they kind of overlap each other. So reduce everything into shapes that will later get values assigned to them. And then after that, you'll assign texture to certain um, zones. So again, no more names, no more trees, bushes, and paths. Instead, is this my foreground zone? Is this my middle ground zone? Is this my background zone? What shape is that? And then once you have just the shapes of them, then we will assign value groups. So this is the next point, point number three. You want to assign clear value groups. And this really trips us up, especially with landscapes, because there's so much going on. 
and we think that um, we need to be truthful to all the different nuances. But what we want to do is this, I did it earlier, we want to squint, we want to zoom out, and then we want to compare, okay, the foreground strip in comparison to the middle ground strip. If I had to decide between the two, and I'm literally, when I do this, I let my eye flick back and forth, background, middle ground, background, middle ground, middle ground, foreground. And I kind of flip back and forth asking myself, which one is darker when I do this? Squinting, you have to squint. Um, and which one is lighter? And then on my page, I do this, okay? You want to remember, or you want to limit yourself to five value groups. And again, I'll demo, I will demonstrate all of this. I just kind of want to give you the information up front so you know what's coming as we're drawing. And then now when we actually do the drawings, it won't be the first time that you've heard me say this stuff. Okay, so once you've assigned your value groups, just five, five is plenty, trust me, especially for these smaller sketches we're doing. Then we want to think about this term called atmospheric perspective. So you might be familiar with this term, but if you're not, let me explain it briefly. Atmospheric perspective is this visual phenomena where things that are up close to us look very um, contrast rich, full of detail. We can see them clearly. We can see everything that's happening in there. And as things move away from us, they get a little bit less clear, a little bit less detailed, and actually also lighter. And if you're dealing with color, grayer, sometimes even bluer, depending on what the weather situation is. But since this is not a painting class, which, you know, that would be so much fun to do as well. I'm talking about color, but I'm restraining myself. Um, um, we're just dealing in terms of value right now. Whatever is further away from us gets lighter. Whatever is closer to us is darker or at least contrast richer. So whatever is in the foreground, that's where you want to have your big contrasting values. As you get into the middle ground, take that contrast out a little bit more. And then if you're in the background or background for you guys like this, um, very, very little contrast. And with that, so to wrap up this lesson up front, to honor that atmospheric perspective, you then have to decide, and this is actually a good thing, where are you going to put detail? Because, you know, if you have 10 minutes to sketch, maybe you have an hour to sketch, that's not a lot. You can't draw all the leaves, you can't draw all the branches, it's just too much stuff. So you have to make a choice where you're going to add your details. And the choice is being made to, um, for you easily because of atmospheric perspective. It makes sense to put your details up front in the foreground. It makes um, sense maybe to put it in the, in the front middle ground, you know? So you have a little bit of artistic license where if there's something in the middle ground that you just love, you can make it work and put the, the details in the middle ground. But what I would never suggest, and I know never say never, but I wouldn't suggest putting the details and the texture implications in the background because texture always makes things advance, makes it th come at us. Um, because that's, it's, like, it's like Velcro for our eyes. If you put texture, if you put details, our eyes suck to it and they want to look there. But if you want the viewer to feel like, oh, there's spaciousness, you don't wanna put any details in the background. Okay, so that is um, what I wanted to say up front. Also, remember, just because something is in front of you, whether it's on a photograph or in real life, doesn't mean it has to become part of the drawing or not at least in the way that you see it. You can move trees around, you can take out bushes, you can tone down texture. So that's why it's so cool to be an artist. You get to design and compose and, you know, kind of cook up your own little forest stew. I don't know where that came from. Anyways, so let me find real quick where I can change the camera setting. Okay, so here's this, let me transition. Here we go. Okay, and you let me know if for some reason the camera is too blown out, you can't see or it's blurry. Um, I tried to get it dialed in pretty well earlier on. Let me set a timer. So we're doing 10 minutes for the first one. Just so you can see me um, go through the decision-making process that I just explained. 
Okay, here we go, 10 minutes. And as I said, the first thing we wanna do is to create a, a, a frame for us. Hold on, let me scoot this over a little bit. And we have done a landscape drawing session before. And in that session, we talked about composition. So you won't hear me talk too much about composition in this one, but if you're interested in that, scroll down all the live sketch sessions that we that um, I have the recordings up for. And that was actually a really good one. Sound quality isn't that great in that one, but you know, make do. Um, okay, so I, I decided what format I want to draw inside of and um, this is something I didn't say up front it's so important to have a drawing process Chris just popped in and <laughs> he always reminds me um, after our sketch sessions that that that's something he's always working on reminding himself that there is a process to things that you don't have to tackle all the details um, in the first five minutes that you um, work your way up to the details. Okay. And so this process goes very simple, very light to more and more complex, more and more refined, more and more um, decisive. And when I say decisive, I mean like drawn in a way where it's hard for you to erase. Okay, so this line here, that's my foreground line. So that's, so you see the path going here, right? Uh, and then we have like some shrubbery, some low growing shrubs. This is the edge of that low growing shrub. This is my foreground shape. Look how simple that is. It's basically just a triangle, you know? So our brain usually just goes like, ah, bushes and, and, and flowers and grasses. And you go crazy with the little rocks up front. Um, but that's really not useful at this stage. Then you have your middle ground. So middle ground is where those trees are growing. I'm not drawing the trees yet. And then that tree arrangement is growing along that hillside, it's slanting down. So that's this line here. Then there's a slightly further set back middle ground right there. And then you can see far up in the distance through the California haze, the background. So we have foreground, front middle ground, back middle ground, tiny little bit of background. This is what you have to begin with. And um, there is no shame in this not looking glamorous. I mean, come on, it's just a bunch of lines, right? But being able to do this makes you a good artist. Then my next phase is and now I'm going to place where my main items are. So my main items in this case are these trees and I'm not worrying whatsoever about making them look like trees at this point. What I'm concerning myself with at this point and it's not worrying, just kind of like what I'm dealing with is placing them. So I have a tree here then slightly spaced apart from it is a cluster. And I just draw a blob, it doesn't even have to look like a tree yet. Then there's a pretty short tree, so you can even go like, whoop, draw like a little wiggly line. And then we have a fairly big tree clump right there. And then things get interesting, right? Because start things start to merge. And one here and one here and then I'm running out of my frame so you see my picture frame um, I don't have as long of a distance to the right that's just open and empty and I'm okay with that um, as I said you don't have to include everything in your frame you can edit things out um, but what I will put back in because again this is my drawing Nobody can tell me what to do and what not to do in this drawing. I am gonna add in this foreground shape from the tree up there. So again, if you handed this to somebody right now, 
they had no clue what you're drawing. They're thinking you're an abstract artist just drawing shapes. And if, if they tell you that, then you should be like jumping up and down with joy inwardly <laughs> because you're, you're, doing, you're doing the right thing. You're going about it the right way. Okay, so the next thing I will um, record are other big shapes I want to include. So let's see. I want to include that shady bush possibly in here. I'm going to leave that one out. I'm going to include that shadow shape in the foreground. Now be aware that cast shadows, they fall over things. So if they have a curvy shape, um, honor that because that's probably indicating that they're falling over a rounded rock or something. Um, I'm drawing in the separation between that kind of low growing shrubbery and the dirt, the exposed dirt. Okay, so at this point, you know how I talked about abstracting things earlier? I've abstracted things into lines and those lines are connecting into shapes. My next step now is to assign values. So let me, um, oh, hold on, I'm gonna backtrack one, one, one um, thought. Notice how these shapes are overlapping each other. So where is this apparent? Here, it's apparent right here. I'm gonna darken this so you can see it, but I wouldn't usually make it this dark. So you see, this is my foreground shape, right? And because of this line here being clearly in front of that line here, this is called an overlap. Or here, my back middle ground is clearly in front of my super background. Again, this is called an overlap. So simplified, these two shapes are not overlapping. These two shapes are clearly overlapping because of this T intersection. So as you're creating your shapes, you want to seek out opportunities for overlaps, especially if your interest is creating depth. Next, you assign your value groups. So you want to squint. Again, that, that is the key. We forget this, but that's why I'm here to remind you. We want to squint at our reference or at our scene, and we want to just kind of scan with our eyes what, again, if, think about if you had to cut this out of construction paper, like you had five values of construction paper, black, slightly darker, excuse me, slightly lighter, lighter and lighter and then white. Um, which, like, how would you place those cutout pieces of construction paper? Like in the foreground, I would have my darkest shape. And you, this is the tricky part, and I want, want to make sure you hear me on this. Do not let your eyes creep open, because that's what's going to happen. You want to open your eyes up more so you can see better. <laughs> well, that's the whole point. Do not open your eyes up more. You don't need to see better. Um, you want to keep them squinted as hard as you can. And then you need to decide, okay, where's my second darkest value group? And the way I see it, it's this middle ground shape. My third value group is the sky. And then the next lightest is the dirt. So then I have four value groups and white or like the lightest one would be for kind of accented details in here. So let's put that in. Hey, Frankie, what's happening? Good to have you here. And if you're painting, um, the rule of thumb is to go background to foreground, top to bottom. But when you're drawing, you don't need to adhere to that rule as much. And so as I am assigning these value groups, what I want you to know is that I'm not interested in variation right now. So when I say a value group, what I mean by that is value shapes. Again, the, the test, if you're doing it right, is if you handed this sketch to somebody and you said, hey, you see how there are different value shapes? I want you to cut out the different value shapes for me. Um, you should end up with clear pieces that all belong to 
the same value groups. Hope that makes sense. Oh my God, 10 minutes is way too fast. I'm gonna keep going a little bit more, so hopefully 15 minutes. Just at least I wanna assign the value groups before we move on. Okay, so I'm gonna make this a little bit darker even. And as I build this value here, I'm not modeling it, I'm not refining it, I'm not looking at the variation, as I said. Second value group was this mid-ground here. And if you're watching this and you're thinking, dude, this doesn't look anything like a landscape lady, I don't know what you're up to. Um, I'm fully aware of this. It's not supposed, I mean, eventually it's supposed to look like a landscape, but at this point, uh, I'm, I'm drawing abstract shapes, remember? And if I have these shapes drawn out correctly, then all of a sudden at the end of my drawing process, I'll arrive at a sketch that looks like a landscape. So this here, this kind of closer middle ground, slightly further away middle ground, if I squint real hard, they're the same value. So let's not even play around here. And then here I have this accented shape from another set of trees. It's kind of interesting, so I can put that in. Again, I'm coming back in here, looking just for the slightly darker accent shapes. Again, kind of making myself not get too carried away. So I'm just trying to lay in kind of the overall shape. And then here I'm still in blob, blob land over here. So I haven't even dealt with what these trees are supposed to really resemble. And again, when we only have like 10, 15 minutes, you've got to cut to the chase and, and create a, a simplified version of, of what it is you're looking at. And especially in the beginning, those simplified versions will just not sit right with you. They're just, they're gonna feel unsatisfying and you're gonna be tempted to just like keep noodling on it. Um, if you're trying to learn, if you're trying to grow, um, stick with the discomfort of having a kind of weird looking drawing, just so you can learn what it is that we're trying to practice here. Like any growth, has lots of moments of feeling like, oh, this is so weird. I don't understand. Like whenever you feel that way, dude, you should celebrate this. That means like there's something happening right now. You're like hitting your edge. And if you keep going, you'll learn something new. Okay, so see, at this point, my foreground almost looks the same as the middle ground. So I have to make sure I separate this valley group out from the middle ground. Then let's um, assign a valley group to the dirt and to the sky, and then we'll move on to the second picture. So the way skies work, I mean, gosh, skies are so versatile, but you notice how they're darker up top and then they get lighter towards the horizon. Again, this here is that foreground shape. And again, those things, they don't need to look like anything recognizable. They're almost like design elements. Just as long as your brain kind of visually connects them with like, okay, they're on the same plane, the same spatial level as what's happening down here, then you're all good. Okay, last is what's happening here. 
and here. I'm so if you could see me right now, I'm squinting my eyes and I'm kind of moving my up my, my head up and down, up and down, kind of comparing what I have value wise happening on my sketch and what I have value wise happening on um, the screen in front of me. And again, I know I've said it so many times, but I can't say it enough. You want to be squinting at this time. It's so tempting to open up your eyes, but you know what happens when you do that? That's when the confusion starts again. It's like, uh, all the stuff, all the details. Am I supposed to draw that right now or what? So um, don't even go there. I'm lighting this one up here. It's my super background here. So in the the this background strip like this that's all the way in the back that should be darker than your lightest part of the horizon and so now so this is a good foundation to add detail into it I'm going to move on to the next picture um, but I would now start working on um, the the path and picking a couple of these, maybe this kind of yellow flower section, maybe this bush over here, and starting to add and pull texture out on some of these edges. So you'll see me do this in, at least in the last piece for sure. But let's go through this process one more time with another image. There's always so much talking to be done, I don't get very far. There we go, put this over. Hope this is making sense to you guys. Hope you're having fun. Let me switch the image. Okay, so here we have this, the colors on this thing. I don't know, somebody had fun in Photoshop. Uh, at least that's what it looks like. But I wanted to give you a different um, image to work with where we don't have, so mountains are easy because mountains stay literally are sitting in front of each other like this, the, the zones that I mentioned earlier. This here is a little bit less obvious, but it's still the same principle. Um, first thing I'm doing is I'm making a frame with my hand, deciding which parts of the image do I want to include and which ones do I want to take out. And whenever you have a symmetrical setup, you see, you see how we have the, the kind of creek in the middle and then trees on the left and trees on the right. So that, that's like compositionally speaking, it's called an approximate symmetrical composition. So you wanna make sure that you offset that symmetry unless you're trying to talk about how um, controlled of an environment it is. So I'm going to make it in my image that the stream is going over more to the right side. So again, that was my last point in the setup of the lesson. Just because it's in the picture doesn't mean we have to include it or include it in the way that we see it. Landscapes are beautiful subject matter to study composition with. As I said earlier, we did a whole lesson on just that. So tonight I'm not talking about composition that much, but it, you know, it's it's part of it's part of drawing. So again, in the beginning, we want to stay erasable. We want to be able to move things. So let's say I draw this tree here. I don't like this placement now that I see it on the page. You know, if I draw lightly, I can easily take that thing out and say, no, I, I want it more over here to the left. That feels better. And I want it smaller or bigger or whatever it is. So course for that you'll have to practice um, how to hold your pencil how to control the pressure of your pencil and I know this is something that a lot of you struggle with um, but this too can be learned it's not impossible
So just to recap what I was introducing earlier on, we, we're beginning our drawing by deciding what's in and what's out. Then we um, break whatever is inside of our frame into abstract elements, lines and shapes to begin with. And um, if we're interested in creating a, a sense of spaciousness and depth, we want to look for opportunities to explain with our marks that this is in front and that is behind. So for example, with this tree cluster here, I want to make sure that I translate that this shape is sitting in front of this forest edge. That my, my, my tree shape over here is sitting in front of this forest edge. Um, we can push this even more. So in terms of foreground, middle ground, and background, so we have our foreground where the creek is. All of this is foreground. Then we have a fairly narrow middle ground and from the back of the creek to the edge of the forest. So it's a very narrow middle ground. And then the background is the forest. And so to kind of come back to this idea of overlap, you see how right here we have this little bush. Um, I don't like it where it is right there because it's so close to this, but I'm going to pretend like it's sitting over here. And I'm going to place it in a way where it's overlapping my middle ground background line and even the background line too. So again, that's going to reinforce this idea that this is in front and the other stuff is behind. So overlaps are crazy powerful, um, more so than shading. Okay, so now I have my Sorry, I'm tracing along the edge. This creek here. I'm gonna be a bit more careful with this. So I'm working a bit more on the shapes of my foreground here. So we have these kind of patches of reed, I think it's called this kind of grass. And so I'm thinking of them not as individual grasses, I'm thinking of them in terms of clumps. So here we have one pillow, um, here we have another pillow. And again, I'm going to make sure that it reads like this pillow is being overlapped by that pillow. And that this pillow here is overlapping what's happening here. And that this here is overlapping what's happening here. So you see this here, this here, and this here to this here. So again, those are called T intersections. You can do the same thing over here. I forgot to set my timer. Oh well. We'll just see how much time I have left over after I'm done with this. <laughs> see, I have a plan and then I get going and then, you know, all hell breaks loose. But we'll just roll with it. That's just how it is. One, two. So you see, kind of in the middle part of the foreground, we have these two clumps of grass. And they're overlapping this here. Okay, getting too carried away with the, the lumps. Let's deal with some value groups. And um, so again, the first thing I will do is squint and just look at the reference while squint squinting super hard, imagining if I only have five value groups, how would I allocate them? So I have a really dark area here and the two trees. So that's my number one darkest value. Then I'd make the forest line. So you might argue now, well, but when I squint, that forest shape looks as dark as the other two to me. And you'd be right. But this is where I'm adjusting it 
because it's supposed to be the background and we talked about atmospheric perspective. So I'm gonna make this here lighter than what I'm gonna assign here, here, and here. So I'm gonna make this my number one, my number two. We're gonna make this number three. And then the sky, we're gonna have our lightest values. So let's um, let's dive in with that. And so the tendency or the temptation is that we wanna let our eyes creep open. You know, it's so satisfying to see all the things. And we as artists were so good at seeing details. We did a whole sketch session on, on, on reveling in details, right? Um, but man, that, that tendency we have, um, it, it has to bide its time. And it has its price, you know, because if we jump to the details right away, um, we lose sight of our big underlying structure. And then we wonder why the hell our drawings don't look well structured, well, well built, not as solid, not as proficient as you'd like them to be. It's because we get into the, into the details too soon. And it's, it's just not as satisfying, to be honest, to draw just abstract shapes. I mean, hell, I'm, um, I went to an art school that focused on traditional art making techniques, um, classical drawing and painting, because I love drawing things, things that I can recognize. I had no interest in becoming an abstract painter, an abstract um, artist, a conceptual artist. I wanted to be an artist who can draw things realistically. So I totally am with you if, if that's, uh, if, if you can relate. Um, but you know, the whole abstraction movement, I mean, it's, it's not, it didn't come from thin air. It has its root, its origin in, in classical art. That's what they do. They take something and see how much they can abstract it down to. For me, I like it when we then add the details into it eventually, you know? Okay, so um, this is my darkest value group here. I'm playing around a little bit with lighter ones, but let me just go in order. So I'm gonna go now to my next darkest value group. I'm not worried about making these trees look like um, very detailed trees. I'm just trying to grab the essence of them. Squint, squint, squint. So if I can give you anything, maybe I should make an app and like sell it for lots of money. Uh, an app that you just start when you draw and then every two minutes it says squint, <laughs> squint. And um, it's just your, your reminder then to squint, zoom out and compare. Okay, so it, I'm intending to have this value be the same as this value, the same as this value. So I don't have enough cameras, but if you could see me again, I'm like squinting and constantly glancing up and down. So my head, when I, when I draw well, <laughs> my head is constant, constantly moving up and down. If I'm not drawing well, it's usually because I'm just staring at my page. Anybody can relate to that? It's like you get so zeroed in on your drawing and you think by staring harder at your drawing, you can con control better what's gonna happen on it. Anyways, that, that's me when, when I'm not having a good drawing day. Cause like what happens is if you don't constantly glance up and down, you're starting to draw from from memory and unless you already kind of mastered the principles of classical drawing um you'll you'll draw mistakes because 
because you're you're not kind of taking the visual information that's in front of you. You're drawing something that you think you saw. There's a difference between drawing from imagination because you understand in your head what it would look like and um, trying to control your drawing by just kind of staring it down. I don't know if that makes sense. Okay, so here I got my three darkest value areas. I'll probably have to darken them later one more time. Then my second darkest value area is that background forest strip. So I can see that I already need my trees to get darker. And then this here was gonna, was the bush that I moved over. So let me see if this is my river edge. Let's let this grow out of here. And I'm gonna make it, so in the photo, again, the bush looks almost lighter or at least the same darkness as the forest. We're going to make this darker. Or I'm, I'm going to make this darker. I don't know about you. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do, but I'm going to make this darker because I want it to read closer. Right? I want this to be part of that foreground. I'm going to leave the background the way it is. I'm going to darken up my trees, especially on the shadowy parts. So trees are gigantic pillows, at least the very foliage rich ones. They're gigantic pillows, but the pillows are not made out of cotton sheets. The pillows are made out of um, like some weird tassely cloth. That's a word, right? Tassely cloth. Like, you know, one of those rugs that has like lots of hair sticking out of it. What is that called? Shag, shaggy, shaggy carpet. Isn't that what it's called? So pill, uh, trees are pillows made out of shag carpet. So again, when I'm dealing with this tree, my tendency is I want to open up my eyes. I want to see all the little sky holes and I want to do all the little things. So I really have to kind of discipline myself in a gentle and loving way um, to not open my eyes up at this point. So the theme, so especially because I am directing this lesson a little bit at, if you're a beginner for, for landscape drawing, the theme is to simplify everything, to take out the details until you're towards the end of your drawing, until you have all those big simplified shapes in, and then you can open up your eyes and place texture and details in areas most likely or best chosen in the foreground. That was a weird way of saying that, but you know what I mean. So I have my darkest darks, my group number five, this, 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 these are my fives. This is my group number four, valley group number four. I have this shadow falling across here. That's lighter than what's happening back here. So when you build value, there's always a push and pull. Oh my god, I didn't realize my drawing was kind of drifting out of the frame. I'm so sorry. Um, you, you establish the value first, always giving yourself the opportunity to make it darker. So that's why pushing hard is problematic because You can't backpedal after a while. OK, 
Okay, so I'm, I'm going to let it go. So I was thinking about like adding the group of tree over here, but since this is not about composition, I'm just going to let it go. Uh, I'm going to as assign a lighter value for the sunlight parts. So with with um, value, everything's relative. You you can't see it accurately in your drawing until you have everything surrounding it uh, in place. So for me to know how dark to go with what I have here in the foreground and how light to keep the other stuff, I, I need to build it simultaneously. And um, you want to keep an eye on where your lightest parts are. So for me, the lightest parts, and I'm squinting like so hard, I can almost see nothing left. My lightest parts are these bright yellowish patches maybe in here and then the clouds those are the lightest ones there and these are not white clouds these are kind of purpley clouds so you'd get even more of a um, you get a darker value for them Remember, higher up in the sky, you get a darker value. As you get closer to the um, horizon, you get a lighter value, unless you have some big thunder clouds back there. There's always an exception. <laughs> it's never cut and dry. So this whole side here is in shadow. I'm gonna drop this down a value step. And then this foreground here is being hit by light again. So again, the way you can judge if your sketch is on the right path is if you sit back, lean back, zoom out, look at the whole sketch in one glance, you squint at it, you ask yourself, how easy would it be for me, me to cut out my, my, my value shapes? And if your answer comes back, oh, I don't even know where I would cut for my value three shape, then you know you need to clarify that. Okay, and then texture, I'm gonna bring that in on the foreground. If you wanna know more about texture, watch the Fox lesson. We talked about where to imply texture and how to imply texture. So the area that I'm drawing right here, that's the reflection of those grasses. So reflections are pretty dark most of the time and they're like a mirror. So they're not shadows. This is not a shadow. Neither is this here. These are reflections. So you want to think about water is like if you put a mirror underneath something. And so the reflections are always straight up and down. They're never off to the side. Like, see, these here are shadows. The shadows are going to the side. The reflections are going straight up and down. Okay, so I'm going to let this sketch go. 
again, reminding myself this is a sketch session, not a making art session, but you can see how um, this is all coming together now. So let me see how much time we have left. Not that much. But I was talking pretty long earlier on. So let's let's give ourselves like 25 minutes for the last one. How about that? I'll just put this timer on. So let me make this just a bit bigger. Okay. Hitting start on the timer. 25 minutes for this one. And let's see how it goes. So I think 25 minutes is kind of like what we had just now, but that's okay. So remember, you want to begin with a frame. I'm going to just squint at the drawing, at, at the photograph for a little second, deciding what I want to include. If I want to go with this horizontal format. Yeah, let's just go with it. Okay. Now I'm breaking all the things that have names, like that hill in the foreground, that grass in the foreground, that slope in the foreground, that cabin, like all those things. I'm going to break that into really simple lines. And the, the simpler you can make this line, so the tendency is going to be to do this. So watch me just for a second. So instead of drawing these simple clear cut lines, you're going to want to draw like this. Because I know you. Because <laughs> I wasn't all that different and all of my students, uh, we're all the same. Nobody is all that different. But you see how here you're interested in, in the little lumps and the little clumps and all the little undulations going up along this ridge but what we want if you want to have a clear well easy to read drawing we want to have good shapes and to have good shapes to create that good structure i swear i i i'm, I'm not so obsessed with structure because i'm german maybe i am but um but that structure makes your drawing later on feel like like a professional drew it, you know, like it's not going to come apart any second. Okay, foreground, boom, in. Um, middle ground are the trees. So in the beginning, I, as I said earlier, don't even think about them as trees and I, like, I don't concern myself with making them look like trees. I'm just blobbing them out. I'm counting how many trees do I have, and I'm giving each tree a little blob placement. And what you can do is you can kind of connect the tips and see what kind of a slope would be created for it, uh, in, among them, between them. I have to lower this one down. Okay, middle ground. So of course we have this cabin, which signed me up any day to live there. That just sounds perfect to me. But again, I'm, <laughs> I'm not futzing around to make this a perfect cabin right now. I'm just kind of seeing, okay, this is how big it's gonna be in my drawing. And these are the biggest shapes for it. And last, and notice this, hold on, let me just think. Yes, this here, this kind of path that we're coming up on is overlapping the slope. The slope is overlapping the cabin. The cabin is overlapping our tree cluster behind it. And that tree cluster is overlapping 
that mountain off in the distance. Have I mentioned that overlaps are a thing? I think I have. Okay, and then here in the foreground, we have this tree coming up. So I'm gonna keep following the same process that I've been explaining. I wanna tell you a couple of things. Like if you like, if you like, um, the way I do these sketch sessions, and if, if you feel like you're learning something, I, I really want you to consider signing up for my upcoming webinar. Um, it's I have two dates for it. One is on Monday. The other one is next Thursday at this time. So for instead of having a sketch session, I'm doing a webinar, but you have to sign up for it. It's not just live and anybody can watch it. You have to sign up for it. It's free, but um, you have to register. Um, and it's about finding your creative voice, like discovering it, like what are you all about? Like what's your style? Like, you know, what's your creative thing? By building a unwavering drawing practice. We think we need to have like a grandiose art studio and need to take all these classes and go to art school um, to be a real artist, but we really don't. So in this webinar, I'll show you like how you just by building a really um, regular drawing practice based on classical drawing principles, how that will lead you to your own creative voice. And so um, if you like how I do things, I really would love for you to attend. It's going to be super fun. I've, I'm building it right now. I'm, I'm designing the, the class right now. I have a ton of slides, hundreds of pictures. Um, you'll learn a bunch. And you'll also, at the end of it, you'll learn about my class that just opened up today. So it's, the class hasn't started yet. You can, you can enroll for it, but it hasn't started yet. It's called Better Drawings Academy. And, and during that webinar, I'll tell you about that too. Alrighty, so now that I have my shapes, um, I put in that kind of foreground element. Well, hey there. SOS, oh no. <laughs> I hope you're all doing good. Um, now I'm going to assign my value groups. So remember, I give myself about five. First, I'm kind of scanning the image. My darkest is going to be the cabin and this area right here. So one, so it's going to be number five. Then number four is going to be the trees. Number three is going to be the hill. And then the lightest one are going to be the clouds and this path right here. So I always just want to give myself a little bit of a strategy before I dive into assigning the values. And with a small sketch like this, I don't bother much with a perspective. I really just eyeball it. If this was a bigger drawing and I made the structure more of a prominent element, you'll betcha that I will think about the perspective of it. So again, when I assign my darkest value group, so tempting to start making this wall darker here and the other thing lighter. I'm not letting myself do that. Okay, and then here we have the starker value over here. So when I sketch, like right now, you can see how the way I put the value in, it's very loose and scribbly almost. And um, when I am in a sketching mode, then I'm 
totally okay with that. If this was supposed to be a refined value drawing where you can see all the nuances of the values, uh, I would not be moving my hand the way I am right now. I'd be making um, slower movements. I wouldn't push so hard, but since I only have, I don't know how much time I've left, um, but I have only a couple more minutes left, you know, I need to make ends meet. Oh, thanks for letting me know, Bill. <laughs> it keeps happening. See, I want to make sure that I am zoomed in enough so you can see the drawing better because I feel like the last few times I was zoomed out too far, but then it only allows for a really small place to hold the board, but thanks for letting me know. It's a team effort here. How, how about that? Like somebody, I, I'm, I'm making the app that tells you to squint and zoom out and, and you make the app that tells me to move my drawing board <laughs> into the frame. So in case you've forgotten at this phase of the drawing, I'm squinting and um, not just, you know, squinting for squinting's sake, but I'm squinting and comparing. So if I squint the tree and I compare it to the roof, which one is darker? By how much? And so again, you want to think in about these values in terms of only five groups. From your darkest dark to lighter, 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 and lightest. Not in terms of all the variation. Because, you know, obviously there are the shutters here and there are like the slats here. And, and But if I deal with that, I'm going to lose the integrity of my, of it feeling like a landscape that belongs together. Okay, I still have time. Good, good, good. I have about 13 minutes, so I was curious. Because I'm sure you've experienced this too. <laughs> that when you get going, when you kind of sink into the drawing process, you, you lose track of time. <laughs> Jacob, I like your comment. I'd rather draw myself in there. <laughs> Just to get to hang out there but I totally know what you mean so if you're on my email list if you've been following me on Instagram you probably know that last week I was in the mountains that was quite quite the wildlife adventure um, so we have a dog that's fairly new and I take her on early morning walks and so I think it was three times out of the six or seven morning walks that we had we ran into a um, at least one coyote. At one point we ran into two coyotes and at another point we heard a whole pack of coyotes. So this was at about six in the morning, a whole pack of coyote ripping something apart off in the distance. Like we we're far enough away, but it, it was kind of spooky. And, and, and those are some healthy looking coyotes. Like they're not just like some mangy, thin little fellas. They're really sturdy. And um, I mean, you know, coyotes are not really a threat for for us uh, but still you know if you're all by yourself and my dog isn't huge she's not little but she's not huge either um, it was it was nice it wasn't a bigfoot but you know it was wildlife it was fun okay so right now I was just working on um, getting these shapes to be tree-ish to be similar to what I see here. I'm not trying not to, but you know, trying not to obsess over making it look exactly like this tree at this point. It's tempting, but um, I just wanted to get the, the, the placement, the shape, kind of make it look like it. 
and, and assign that value group. So remember, this was one of my darkest value groups here. So I'm going to push that darker now. Now that I know more, now that I know how dark I want these to be, I can emphasize this to closer to 100% full value. Anybody else have fun wildlife stories to share? I know you're drawing. I shouldn't I shouldn't distract you. But if you have a fun wildlife story, you can tell me on Instagram or later at the end you can put it in the comments. Okay, so with this tree here, um, I'm gonna go off of the idea of atmospheric perspective. It's part of our foreground zone. So I wanna add the highest contrast and the richest values there. So even though you could argue well, but on the right side, it's kind of light, I see the light hitting it. Uh, on the left side is the, the shadowy area. I'm gonna emphasize the shadowy area and then kind of push that contrast between the light trunk and the shadow on the left. Could try and play up that, um, kind of these little leaves. I'm making them dark, but look for the other landscape sketch session I did. I talked about that in detail there. Weird, I see the stream buffering. Hope it's not too bad. Um, so if you're wondering like how I'm applying the value. I'm, I'm trying to think of it in terms of um, just flat value. See, I'm, I'm moving my pencil either left to right or up and down. Um, and I'm assigning one valley group to planes that are facing this way and another valley group that, to planes that are facing the other way. And I first begin with the overall big planes, and then if you have time, you can chisel in some of the smaller chunks that you see in there. But for now, let's just stick with the easy, bigger shapes. And see, now that I have my foreground value, I'm going to push these darker again, because I want to have five different values, right? And this is going to be one of my lightest values. So value work is always a back and forth. It's a dance. So um, the reason why I drew landscapes, by the way, is because I had a request. So if you ever have a request, like, oh man, I wish you did a sketch session on this, this, and this, please let me know. You can just put them into the comment section here on YouTube. You can send me a DM on Instagram. If you're on my email list, you can just hit reply on any of my emails and um, suggest something there. Um, this is as much your time as it is mine. And it's my pleasure to help you out. Um, however, in the next few weeks, as I mentioned, I'm, since I'm opening um, my drawing class, there probably won't be as many live sessions while I'm teaching the class because uh, I'll be going live with the class only. I will have pre-recorded stuff for you guys. So, but if, if it's something specifically for the sketch session that you have a request for, that will have to wait until after the class, unless you're of course in the class and then you can request in the class as well. So you see how um, 
on this tree area, let me just see if I can bring this out a little bit more. Just kind of darkening this overall value of this tree group. And I made this lighter here. This is not because there is like the strong direct sunlight, but it's like this kind of glow. It's like these clouds are glowing and they're kind of covering over what's happening here. And like it kind of adds a little bit of lightness there. And I like that. So that's why I did that. So if you want to have that misty feel, anything that has mist over it, gets treated lighter. Oh, Jacob, are you talking about um, the live video that I did? If, if that's what you're talking about, um, you know how you can go to somebody's profile and then the thing that you see on their profile, is, it's like a grid and in the grid are a bunch of pictures. So you can usually find it in there, but they're also like along, like on top of that grid, there are these little buttons and one is for where you can see reels the other one is where you can see Instagram live. Oh, it's called Instagram TV if it's recorded actually. Um, so you want to tap one of those and that's where the recordings for those videos are. If that's what you're talking about. And um, if, it, if you want to see me talk live on Instagram and you're um, online at the right time, you want to look for that circle. So again, you go to my profile and you know how there's the grid, but then above on the top left corner is our, is like the round profile image icon. And if that has like a pink colored circle around it, you just tap on that and then you'll kind of join the live recording. So, and I know it, this is, I don't know how, how well versed you are in Instagram. So if you already know all that, then sorry <laughs> for being redundant. Um, but if, if you're not that well versed in Instagram, you wanna um, kind of go, go online at the time that I'm live and then tap on my round profile circle. And that's how I can join me live. And But I always keep the recording up too. And if you still don't know, uh, how to do that, um, you can send me a direct message on Instagram. It's a little paper plane in the top right corner. I know it's a, it's a whole animal onto itself. Okay, let's see. Two minutes left. All right. <laughs> so this is perfect because see I have my big valley groups laid in. Oops, I drift. Um, it's clear that this is my darkest. This is my darkest. You know what? It's not that clear. Let me darken this even more. This is my darkest accent here. And I don't need to know what it is. That's the beauty of understanding um, drawing and understanding the power of abstracting things. Uh, if you have the right shape, it doesn't matter if you know what it is that you're drawing. Um, I want to make sure that the cabin reads darkest and the kind of foreground left bottom area reads darkest as well. And then the trees behind should be slightly lighter. So that's what I'm working on right now. And if you only have very little time left, you got to cut your losses. I never know if it's cut or count one of those things. And you have to decide where you're going to add um, the last little details, the last texture. And again, foreground is probably better. So let's play a little bit with what's happening here. I want to get some of this clumpy feel happening. And here I'm thinking about facets. This is a facet that's angled this way. It's going to be darker. Everything else is facing up. That's a lighter green. Have I mentioned, if you squint, you can see the shapes easier. Oh, 
And again, you are the artist. You get to decide how much you put in, what you leave out. Okay, I just, this was my buzzer going off. I'm just gonna add a little bit more and then we'll call it a night. And um, don't go away quite yet. I'm gonna recap the lesson for you. Uh, if you like to take notes, you can do that as I recap the lesson for you. There. Not bad. <laughs> See, landscapes are so much more forgiving than portraits. It's like when I have a bad portrait night, it's just, oh dear. <laughs> you know. Okay, let me switch this over and wrap everything up. Where's my cursor? Okay. Here we are. Well, I hope you had a good time. I, I hope that what I was explaining made sense and that you could see me kind of implement what I was um, talking about. Let me recap for you so you can take notes or you just hear it one more time. As you might be aware, the more we repeat things, the more we keep hearing people tell them this, tell us the same thing, the more we actually retain the information. So it's intentional, not because I want to be redundant. Number one, the first thing you have to do if you want to wrangle with um, a landscape is you need to decide what's in your drawing and what's out of your drawing. And to do so, you want to think about a, a frame that you look through and you can decide if you want to make it a vertical frame or a horizontal frame, how much you include, you can zoom in or out, um, but decide that first. So the beginning of your landscape is not even you drawing, the beginning of your landscape is you deciding and then you begin with your frame you actually draw that rectangular frame and then you begin and the the trick it's not a trick but the thing that you need to think about is shed the idea that the things that you're drawing have names trees bushes paths none of that instead squint at all of it and decide if i had to make this into a shape that I want to cut out of construction paper, what would that shape look like? Would it be triangular? Would it be an even triangle or kind of slanting triangle? How wide is it at the base? How, how quickly does it go to the tip? Um, so be very descriptive in your shapes, but make them simple. And then if our goal is to build depth, you want to look for opportunities to overlap these shapes and create clear T intersections with these overlaps because that creates that spatial depth. Once you have that, that very simple, just linear treatment where everything just looks like a bunch of lines and you, you just think like if I color it in, it looks like an abstract painting. Um, your next step is to assign five value groups. And um, you want to make sure that your darker value groups are either in the foreground or in the middle ground. You don't want to put them in through the background. And you really want to limit yourself to only five. And I know it's really tough because there's so much texture in the landscapes, right? Um, like grasses, they have each a lit side and a shadow side. And, and so our brain gets kind of overstimulated by that. And to counter that out, you need to squint really, really hard. and. It's not about you being a bad artist usually when you don't like your drawings. It's about you not remembering yet that you need to squint and zoom out when you draw. So um, that is step number three. It feeds into step number four that you need to be aware of atmospheric perspective. Let me take a swig of water real quick. And atmospheric perspective dictates that you have higher contrast up front, more details up front, darker values up front, less contrast in the back, less details in the back, lighter values in the back. And then the last point that I made throughout the evening is that just because something is in your landscape doesn't mean it has to become part of your drawing. And just because it's in a certain spot in the landscape doesn't mean you have to leave it in that spot. If you want to include it, you can move things around your landscape, your drawing. And um, sorry, I have an itchy nose. Um, when you add details, 
make sure you put them in the front. I think I said that, but I wanted to make sure that that is intentional. So Jacob, you're asking what part of Germany are you from? I am from this little cow town in the south of Germany. So it's about an hour outside of Munich. So it's very rural and it's very beautiful, very idyllic. So that's where I'm from. So not quite the mountains, uh, but, but nearby the mountains. If you have questions, let me know. If you followed along and this was one of your first sessions and you're not on my email list, be sure to get your name on my email list. So you just go into the description box below where this um, see more link and it'll drop down and you can sign up for my email list and get either a pen and ink tool guide or a free workbook that will help you figure out how to improve your drawings with three simple questions. Or if you're into figure drawing, you can sign up for a free mini course that will explain to you exactly why figure drawing is so powerful for artists, how to go about it the right way, what tools to use when you do your first drawing, what should you be thinking about? So you can sign up for any of those three free um, resources that I have for you. And like that, you be added to my email list and I'll send you weekly emails that will keep you motivated and inspired to draw more, to get better. And I think we can all use a dose of that. And um, that's also when you get um, special like early bird discounts on my classes. Like right now, the class is um, opening up. You get a discount if you're in my email list. Um, and if, again, as I said earlier on, if you're just wanting to get more of this, get on the webinar next week. You can choose Monday or Thursday this time, but you do have to register. So, and again, for that in the description below, just look for the link. You go to artisapractice.com and um, the classes tab, and you can see all the things that I have in store for you. So next week, as I said, no drawing sketch session, but webinar, and you don't want to miss it. It's going to be so good. It's discover your creative voice by building a rock solid drawing practice. And I hope to see you there. And if you want to share your drawings with me on Instagram, I'm at Kira Studios on Instagram. Tag me or send me a DM with your work. Hope you had a good time and I see you next time. Bye bye.